It's long been said that the way to someone's heart was through their stomach. It turns out it's also a way to their head. Pastry chef Jackie Kai Ellis knows that well. In her first book, she documents her relationship with food and her journey to finding peace in The Measure of My Powers, a memoir of food, misery, and Paris. She's also the founder of Vancouver's famed Boku Bakery, and we're pleased to welcome Jackie Kai Ellis to our studio tonight. Welcome. Hi, Jackie. Hey. It's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Um, you dedicated this book to M.F.K. Fisher, Mary Frances Kennedy Fisher. Who was she? So she's a, a writer. She did um, sort of little vignettes about her life, and all the vignettes were intertwined with stories about food. So she really believed that food was kind of the, the core of her humanity or, or, or of humanity, period. Mm -hmm. And uh, she kind of tied these moments of uh, compassion and love and, and struggle all through stories about food. Even the name of your book is borrowed yeah. from something that she did. Um, what was it about her that you feel a connection to? You know, I, I struggled from a very, very deep depression at one point in my life. And it was through reading her words that I feel like I was uh, connecting back to the living in some sort of way. Because when you're in the midst of depression, it's, it's horrible. You just feel completely isolated. Mm -hmm. And I've often said that, um, you know, if you can picture being a star in the middle of outer space and where normally other stars would be, it's just emptiness. And that's kind of what it feels like to be, for, well, at least for me, that's what it felt like to be in the middle of depression. But when I read her words and, and she would talk about eating peaches, you know, in the summertime and the juices running down your elbows or, um, you know, putting clementines on a little radiator and then uh, tasting the crispy skin. I mean, that, those things are so bodily mm -hmm. and it kind of brought me back to life. So that's, that's what it meant to me. I want to talk more about your, your depression in a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but what I found really interesting about this book is that you use single letters to name the people yes. rather than reveal their identities, and uh, which gives me the impression that you're a pretty private person. Mm -hmm. um, so why write a memoir? Um, well, you know, I, when I was first, when the, the idea first came up, I actually said no. I was really scared. I didn't. I knew that in order to write a good memoir or a memoir worth writing, you had to write everything, not just the good stuff. Because we live in an age, social media, and all you know, where where there are enough highlights. Mm -hmm. We, in in order for the the good stuff to make sense, um, to have worth. I felt like I needed to share all the stuff that I was still very ashamed of, mm -hmm. and things that I wasn't ready to remember. Um, and in some ways, yes, I am, I am a private person, but I wrote it because I knew that it would make me a better person to have written, that maybe it would help me to get over some of those things, mm -hmm. but also that it was a story that I thought might help someone else to read. Um, maybe someone that's going through depression will read this and realize that they aren't as alone as they, they feel in that moment. I'd like for you to read a passage from the book, which I thought was extremely powerful. Okay. Uh, there you go. I found a space in the kitchen to be free, and I abused it exhaustively as a way to express my creativity and independence, and as a means to exercise my need to explore. I made French cakes that took days to create. I tried complex dishes I'd never tasted before, but was so curious about, like mole sauces and handmade tamales with only a recipe, Googled pictures, and Wikipedia descriptions. I submerged myself in food as a way to be as a way to be distracted from all the feelings I couldn't yet make sense of. It was not only a safe hiding place and a playground, but when the cakes came out moist and the sauces ethereal, I was proud of myself and slowly felt that maybe I was capable. When did you realize, thank you very much for that, um, when did you realize that food was uh, an escape for you? I mean, food's always been important to me. Uh, I joke that, you know, if you're Asian, you're born a foodie. Um, but when I was in the kitchen and there was nobody else, just me, and I could actually smell, taste, hear the food being cooked, there's something about that connection to your senses that pulls you back into the present moment. And I think that that's... So it's like a meditation kind of? Very much like mm -hmm. a meditation, yeah. It's, uh, that's, 
and then at the end of it, when you're eating it, mm -hmm. and it gives you so much pleasure, yeah, it just, yeah, it's so important to me. And it played a huge role um, in growing up as a child in your family. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a story of how your family um, centered itself around food? Yeah, I mean, we we were not a wealthy family growing up uh, for for a large portion of my childhood, and so it was a means to save money. But we ate together every single day, and I grew up with. Uh, my grandparents, my mom and my dad, my sister, two uncles and aunt, and two cousins living all in the same house. And we would eat uh, dinner together every single night. And uh, the conversation around the dinner table was about the food that we were eating and analyzing where all the ingredients came from, uh, whether or not they were fresh, how they could be better, who did a bad job, who did a good job. I mean, it was just complete you know, food critique. It was amazing. And then after they'd finished talking about that food, then we talk about the best one we'd ever had prior to this. I mean, it was just constant. And dumplings, like making dumplings was a family affair. Yeah, yeah. it still is, yeah. Uh, our family's known for making the best dumplings because we have a heritage from Northern China, which are very, uh, they're very known for dumplings. Mm -hmm. And we would get together, all 10 of us, now even more, and someone would do the dough, someone, someone would chop the filling, another person would be doing another thing, and we'd all just bicker and argue about who's doing it right and who's doing it wrong, and yeah, it's, it's really fun. And at the head of it was your grandmother. Yes, yeah. And she was, a, you were very close with her. Yeah, yeah, she, she lived with us and she raised me essentially with, with my aunt and my mother and all my uncles and dad, but I mean, she, she didn't, speak a lot, but she loved me and spoke to me with food. So every day after school, she would cook a meal for me. And I wouldn't even eat lunch at school <laughs> because I knew I'd have the best meal coming home after school. I would just be like, no, who, who wants to eat a ham sandwich when I can go home and have this beautiful Chinese porridge made of yesterday's leftovers and somehow poof. I mean, my mouth is watering just thinking about it yeah. right now. It's, it's just amazing. Did you ever go through those phases when, as a child, you, you're at school and then you bring out all these incredible Chinese food and all the other kids are eating, like, you know, yeah. uh, sandwiches? Did you ever go through that? I did. Um, you know, she, she never packed lunches, but I did have some Chinese things in my, in my lunchbox. Mm -hmm. And I was always embarrassed about it. And I think a lot of um, first, second generation kids can really... Uh, relate to this when they bring something out that's foreign and they're not like other people and I grew up in a school where I me and my cousins were really the only Asian kids in the entire school and so it was weird you know the we wanted just to be like everyone else we wanted to have um, carrot sticks with ranch dressing it was uh yeah but now I'm quite proud of it well, I mean, this is the stuff that's making restaurants, right? Yes. Um, but your mom, I thought it was really interesting. She forbade you and your sister from eating sugar. Yes. But you found a way to go around that. What yes. happened? So she, so she was so strict. Mm -hmm. She wouldn't let us drink juice because it had too much sugar. I mean, that's the extent of her... But she did it because she had a health scare, right? Well, yeah, and she, she did it because she felt like, uh, well, back then it was just, no, sugar is horrible for children. She just got it in her head, so that was it. And so I decided that the only way to eat this uh, chocolate chip cookies that my friends were eating or, or I mean, all those like Rice Krispie squares was to learn how to bake. So I would take my allowance and ride my little red bicycle down to the library and uh, take out books, and I would bake. And how old were you when you did this? Oh gosh, I was like- Seven or eight, right? Seven, eight, you know, somewhere around there. And some of the stuff did not turn out well, and some, I don't even know if anyone knew I had baked that day, because I would eat it all before anyone got home. It was, yeah, it was pretty cool. What is it, do you think, like looking back, uh, was it about baking that you connected to? Well, when I was a kid, it was really because I just wanted to eat it. <laughs> and I, it's funny, even now, people say, well, are, you know, you're a chef or you're... And I just think to myself, I don't know if I'm a chef. I think I just really like to eat. And in order to eat some of the things, even when I was married and, and you know, we were trying to save money, part of the reason why I was making mole and tamales mm -hmm. is because 
I couldn't go out there and buy it. So I needed to be at home making these things. And I'm an eater first and then a, and then a cooker next. And you find solutions to these problems, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I'd like to read something from your book. Uh, you write, family would tell me that I was not really deserving of our family name because I was obviously not as smart as they were. And my aunts and mom were sure that I would have to marry rich because I wasn't smart enough to be successful on my own. I was terrified that it was true and also determined to work as hard as I could to prove everyone wrong. I never wanted to be labeled as stupid or useless again. Mm -hmm. You worked hard to prove these opinions wrong. Did they yeah. make you doubt yourself, like your family? Well, I mean, when you grow up hearing these messages from a lot of different angles, and realistically, you know, when I think back, I wonder, I wonder if I just heard these things and they settled in, in, in me. And every time I heard it again, it would have a magnified impact. Maybe that's what happened. Um, because, you know, children sort of grow up and they have these ideas and everyone's got, everybody has issues, right? Um, you know, have your, like, have your, has your family read that? They have, yeah, they've, and they how, have. How did they respond to that? How you felt? I think that, you know, they haven't really responded about it. Mm -hmm. And I think, Partly, they don't, I don't know if they felt like it was as bad as I remembered it, mm -hmm. which is probably true to a certain degree because, you know, we, we tend to obsess about, you know, these things. But at the same time, I think that there was a lot of worry that I wasn't going to be successful. I mean, I was not scholastic. I, you know, I wasn't the, the kid that remembered all the facts. I, I'm, I have a bad bad habit of, of forgetting details, you know, uh, you know, facts and names and places and dates. And, and a lot of our, our uh, school system is based off of, of memorizing those things. Well, well, when I was growing up, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it was, it was a message that was given to me a lot that I would have to marry rich. <laughs> but through trial and error, and also, I guess, through your own tenacity, you discover that you do have your own talents mm -hmm. and that you want to pursue those. So you decide to go to art school. How yes. did your family react when you told them that you were going to art school? Yeah, they, my mom did not like the idea because as a uh, uh, Chinese-Canadian, um, you know, I'm supposed to go to a science program and, uh, you know, become a doctor or... I don't know, something with a title. And I knew that wouldn't make me happy. So my mom gave me a challenge and she said, well, if you get you know, early acceptance and a scholarship into uh, the science program uh, in, in BC, then I'll let you go to art school. Actually, it was uh, OCAD here in Toronto. Mm -hmm. and. You did it. I did it. And she was, how did she react when you she did it? She was extremely surprised. Mm -hmm. She said... That must have hurt, though. It, it was actually interesting. She actually said out loud, thinking to herself, uh, I only said yes, because I didn't think you could actually do it. And I remember thinking, OK, that means if I'm determined and I just plug away and I go forward and I'm, and I, and I'm tenacious, I can get whatever I want. Mm -hmm. And it was funny, this whole idea of intelligence, you know, even though I got those things, even though I accomplished that, mm -hmm. uh, all these uh, marks of, of intelligence getting into this university and the, into the science program, it still didn't satisfy, uh, you know, my family in saying, oh, Jackie's intelligent now. And it wasn't until I, I was in art school and I decided to take a calculus class because I wanted to prove to my family, because now, now the excuse was, well, you're not in university, so yeah. that's why you're not as intelligent. And I remember I took this calculus class just to prove to myself that I could do it. And I got, I don't know, a really good mark in the calculus class. Yeah. And I remember saying something to one of my cousins, and, and they said, well, you're not in university, so you don't understand this. <laughs> and I said, I got an A in calculus. And I just remember thinking, what am I doing this for? It's mm -hmm. so ridiculous. I have nothing to prove to anyone but myself. Mm -hmm. And if I think I'm smart, maybe that's the... Because everyone's opinion is going to be arbitrary. Mm -hmm. And themselves. ultimately, I think as you get older, you, you realize that uh, it's your opinion that matters the most. Yeah. Um, 
eventually you uh, finish, you become very successful and you become married. Yes. And then one day, and when you met your husband, your former uh, husband, you both had the understanding of that you wanted to have kids. Yes. Um, and then one day he decides that, no, I don't want kids. Mm -hmm. So you traveled. Where did the two of you go? So we decided to split the year in half. I had six months, he had six months, and I traveled uh, with him to Paris mm -hmm. uh, to study pastry. Uh, and then we went all around Italy, uh, all around France, and then to the Congo for a little bit as well. What was that experience like? It was, it was amazing. I mean, that was a decision that he had made because his sister uh, worked for um, uh, wildlife conservation, uh, doing uh, work for guerrilla conservation. And it was such a once in a lifetime opportunity to go with her, see a place like that uh, from a local's perspective mm -hmm. and, and then also understand, you know, her work a little bit more. It was beautiful. Congo is gorgeous, isn't it? It's really nice. Yeah. And it's so otherworldly mm -hmm. in so many regards. I mean, we arrived in uh, this one little town. Goma? Goma, yes. Mm -hmm. And there was, a, there was a volcano that had erupted, I don't even know how many years before. So all the roads mm -hmm. were actually covered in, th they were shaped like lava. Mm -hmm. It was so crazy, but it was so beautiful. And you decide to stay in Paris for a little bit. And yes. it seems like Paris, kind of spoke to you, like it felt like home for you. Yes. Uh, what was that experience like being in Paris? You know, I didn't think I would like Paris as much as I did, um, but it was through exploring it and spending the time and investing, you know, every waking moment, peeking down the little passages, and then it just grew to become so important to me because it was also a symbol of me discovering myself and me discovering the beauty of going out there and living uh, a life that was meaningful to me. But your husband didn't feel the same. No, not at all. Mm -hmm. He hated Paris. Uh, he, he refused uh, to learn French. He did in the beginning, but then he, he said to me, well, I mean, we're never going to stay here and we're going to leave after a few months, so what's the point? And so it just became more and more evident that our, our lives were sort of moving apart from each other because I was diving more headstrong into Paris and he was going away from it. And eventually, um, you actually initiate the conversation around getting divorced. Yes. Um, what finally led you to that conclusion? Well, you know, we had been together for seven years and I, gosh, I had tried everything. Mm -hmm. And I think that I realized that our marriage worked because I, wasn't sure about who I was and what I wanted. And when I became more sure, it was harder and harder to exist in the marriage as who I was versus who I needed to be in the marriage, which, wasn't, which didn't match anymore. And when I realized that there was nothing left for me to do, nothing more for me to try, I just let go. And it's not a huge epiphany it's just, it's like something in your body just relaxes. Mm -hmm. And in the book, I describe it as a light, the light switch, uh, the light the switch go, go flicks mm -hmm. or a twig breaks. It feels as small as that, but it just goes click and you go, I'm done. Mm -hmm. But it took, um, you know, from, you, from the time that you say to your husband, ex-husband, um, that I think we should have a divorce. He says, sit on it for a while. We'll talk about this in six months. Yes. Yeah. Um, and it seemed as if that in, within the relationship, maybe, and tell me if I'm projecting, um, it seemed like he had a bigger voice in the relationship. Um, why, what did the marriage mean to you? Why not leave sooner? Um, I'm, just not, I'm just not one to, re I don't love regretting things. And... This is a man that I still love to this day, not in the, the romantic sense and not in, in the sense that I want to be with him as a, a couple, but I really do believe that when you love someone, you, you don't really stop. There are so many intricacies in a relationship that it's, 
I think that it would be difficult to say that he was bad and I was good and that was it. It was that I needed to be in that relationship to learn that I had a voice because I didn't have one. And when, when, I, when I lacked a voice, I looked for someone with more of a voice to tell me what to do. So, and this is all unconscious, obviously. So what's interesting is because he was telling me what to do, I, it was through that whole experience of having someone have sort of like a larger voice that I started realizing, I started learning by example, one, and also through pressure of being squeezed out of my own body that I needed to push back. But was it his fault? Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't really believe in fault. I really believe in lessons that this was truly the exact relationship that I needed to be in mm -hmm. in order for me to learn the things that I needed to learn. And I, I will always believe that he was my greatest teacher um, or among my greatest teachers. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he had issues with me too because one of, the, one of the arguments that we would have often is, you know, I would ask him, what do you think? And he'd say, I don't want to tell you. You keep on asking me. So it was a push and pull. Yes, he, he did have a lot, of, a lot of opinions. But in the beginning, I was asking him a lot, too. And he also helped you get on the path to um, see a therapist. Yes. Um, you, because you got to the point where you were very suicidal. Yes. And you were actually um, thinking of ways to end your own life. Yes. Um, what kept you from hurting yourself? A lot of it was uh, I couldn't imagine what would happen to my family if I killed myself because one of my cousins had committed suicide and I saw what that did to other people in the family. And her, da her dad was just never the same again. Mm -hmm. um, and realistically, it was, I have just this very strange side of me that's so logical. And so I could see myself in this situation. And I said, well, you know, if you kill yourself, it's awfully permanent. But maybe you should just try therapy as a last resort. And you can always go and kill yourself later. And so that was the first very logical thought. And I think sometimes uh, I've heard that when you're in the midst of that depression, it, you feel so disconnected from your own emotions that it does become a very logical approach to death and life. Um, but yeah, he was, he was pivotal in, in helping me find a, a therapist and pushing me towards that. And you were in therapy for a year. Um, and at one point you decide to really, you really, um, you decide to really live yes. uh, because even after therapy, you were like, okay, but you kind of felt like you always had suicide and you call this a fallback plan. Yes. Um, what happened to change your way of thinking and, and to really live? Yeah, it was, um, I realized that I was straddling that fence of not living, not dying. And so I really couldn't get all the benefits of living. Uh, and if I chose, but I wasn't also getting the relief of dying. So if I always was going to hang on to this suicide fallback plan, I would never go headlong into uh, really truly living if I was always one toe in the other side of wanting to die. So in the end, I just thought, well, this is it. I mean, am I going to do this? Because if I'm not, then I should just kill myself. But if I'm really going to live, then the thought came to me, well, I would, I would have been dead anyway. So I might as well just screw it mm -hmm. and forget about the consequences. Forget about pleasing people. Forget about all the things that I'm worried about when it comes to living and just do it and consider it a life wasted for joy instead of uh, instead of pain. This was years ago, hearing yourself speak and yeah. also when the process of writing them, your memoir. Yeah. What, do you, uh, what would you have liked to say to uh, the younger Jackie? You know what? I, I, don't, I wouldn't want to say anything to her. Mm. I really do believe... It was something that you needed to go through to I get did. to where you are now. Exactly. There's nothing that I would change. I would go through that experience 
moment by moment over again. I would relive it in order for me to be who I am today. And I, I haven't always been able to say that. There were moments where I regretted, I should have done this, I should have protected myself more, I should have spoken up more. No, 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 that was, it was exactly the way it was meant to be. Nothing more, nothing less. And eventually you take all the lessons that you learned uh, in your travels through the Congo, yeah. Italy, and in France, and you decide to open a bakery. Yes. You even write in the book that you know most bakeries don't even get to the point of opening, they fail. Yeah. But you put everything that you had, um, you go into detail, <laughs> yes. to the point of neglecting yourself uh, to a certain point. Yes, yeah, that um, why was it so important for you, uh, for this bakery to work, to succeed? I think in, in retrospect, it was my one lifeline. I needed to know that, because I had, I had split up with my former husband very, very recently, and it was so, I was still building the bakery when, when we were trying to split up, but it was my one lifeline to, to know that I was going to be okay. Also, I was so used to living in this way that I was just like, well, if I'm gonna do it, gonna do it, like go crazy, go to the moon and try it. And if I don't give it my everything, then I'll regret that I didn't give it my everything. So I might as well just do that. And I think that's part of, part of it. Also, when you're just putting one foot in front of the other, mm -hmm. you don't even realize how, how, you much you're, yeah, yeah. how much you're actually accomplishing, yeah. yeah. And the date opened, line, <laughs> you know, out the door around yes. the block. Uh, yeah. So it was, it was successful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we've run out of time. I've <laughs> got so many more questions to ask you, but thank you so much for being here. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.